Okay, well, it's um, it's six thirty, so I'll I'll start the meeting. So before we start, I'll, I'll read out um, the wording. So, um, so I am Councillor Luke Gaskell, the Chair of Community Environment Partnerships Committee, and I'd like, like to welcome everybody to the meeting, which is being held virtually and in accordance with the Council's rules for virtual meetings, which reflect the recent, recently published government regulations. The meeting is being streamed live on YouTube and will be available to view after the meeting is finished. Councillors who sit on this committee are identified by name on the screen and I will introduce officers by name before they address the committee. Councillors are reminded that although this meeting is being held remotely, they are regarded as being present in a meeting of the council and they should observe the normal rules and behaviour under the members code of conduct and not allow members of their household to distract them during the course of the meeting. Can members ensure the mobile phones are now switched off or on silent. Guilty. Members of the committee will turn on the video link during the meeting and keep their microphones muted unless they have been invited to speak by myself as chair. Members are reminded that if they switch off their video link or move away from the camera, they will be treated as leaving the meeting and will not be able to take part in any vote taken on items under discussion. Members can indicate their wish to speak by raising their hands or by using the electronic function and should only speak when I, as chair, invite them to do so. The officers present, present will only switch the video link on during the item that they are presenting or where they wish to, in, to be invited to speak by me as chair. As chair, I will confirm the name of any, any visiting speaker at the appropriate time in the agenda who will address the committee by audio link. Councillors should declare that they are leaving the meeting and switch off their video link if they have a disclosable pecuniary interest or other personal interest in an item on the agenda. The councillors can switch on their video link when I call the next agenda item. Voting will take place by roll call and I will confirm the recommendation proposed to the committee before the voting begins. Can each member indicate whether they are for or against the recommendation or whether they wish to abstain. Hopefully we will not have any IT problems, but can I remind councillors that if their connection is lost, that they should immediately advise democratic support officers and, and use their meeting link to access the meeting again. So I shall move on to item one, which is apologies for absence and substitutions. Um, I know uh, Councillor Kinnear is replaced by Councillor Robinson. Are there any other apologies for absence or substitutions? I'll take that as no, so I'll move on to item two. Um, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Take that as no, so I move on to item four. Uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of September 2020. Are the committee happy that the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of September 2020 are an accurate record? I, that's agreed. Move on to item five. So item five is an update on the ice rink. But before I move on to that, um, at the last committee meeting, uh, we had a discussion on the football ground. And, and obviously things have happened since, um, since that. So I'd just like to um, update everybody on where we are with that, because um, obviously I don't want to lose momentum on that. So, so I have a statement from the council. It's quite lengthy, so bear with me. Um, so, but I'll read it out now. So, uh, CP Football Club update. The potential relocation of the Basingstoke Town, Basingstoke Town Football Club, which was formerly a privately owned club, has been discussed between the council and the club in the past. In 2012, the club presented plans to build a new £10 million, 5,000 capacity stadium with significant financial investment from the owners, with funding from redevelopment of the Camrose land on part of the old common land. 
following further dis uh, cons consideration about the old common, including public consultation, uh, the other sites in, in the council's ownership, the cabinet unanimously res resolved to advise Basingstoke Town Football Club that there was no available or appropriate land in the council's ownership for relocation of the stadium and that no further consideration would be given to the old common as a potential site. The council was approached in late 2016 and 2017 by an interim management group of Basingstoke Town Football Club to discuss the future of the club. Following an announcement by the then owner of this of his intention to end his support for the club. In, 20, in April 2017, the club received a letter from Lamron Estates Limited confirming that a planning application was to be submitted for the redevelopment of the Camero site. Lamron Estates was advised by the council in its capacity as the local planning authority that any planning application for alternative use, uses of the camera site would need to be assessed against relevant local plan policies, including policy CN8, community, leisure and cultural facilities. This required any future planning application which seeks to redevelop the, the site of the, for alternative use to address the criteria in this planning policy in order to provide facilities that are equivalent to the facility being lost. In 2017, the club's interim management group approached Hampshire Football Association and the council with the proposal to, to play at the council's facilities at the Winkleberry Football Complex and the football club and Hampshire FA issued a joint statement which confirmed that both parties would work together to secure benefits at the Winkleberry Football Complex. Alongside plans for a number of improvements that would be delivered by Hampshire FA the statement committed the football club to funding the necessary ground improvements. To support the club's vision, in March 2018, the council cabinet agreed to lease Winklebury Football Complex to Hampshire FA on a 75 year lease. The new lease would enable Hampshire FA and the community club to progress with a planning application to upgrade the facility at the stadium to include a new 3G artificial pitch which meets ground grading requirements for the Southern Premier League Grade D and Grade C standard. With a £50,000 contribution from the council, a project to install the new 3G artificial pitch at Winklebury Football Complex was completed in December 2019. The project was also funded with £200,000 of Amateur FA and 626,217 from the Football Foundation. Further demonstrating the Council's commitment to this project, a £152,000 of Section 106 development contributions was released to carry out further improvement works at the Winklebury Football Complex. The project, which will bring the entire facility up to Grade D standard, includes the installation of the turnstiles, improvements to spectator stands, changing room facilities and fencing at the site. In total, over £1 million of investment has been provided by the council and its partners to the Winklebury site. Following a successful inspection on Friday the 16th of October, Winklebury Stadium Complex was awarded Grade D Stadium status, allowing Basingstoke Town Football Community Football Club to return to playing back, in, back to the borough. Winklebury Barry Stadium will be registered with the Southern Premier League as a home ground for Basingstoke Town Community Football Club. Alongside this work and following the submission of a planning application for the redevelopment of the Camero site, planning officers have been working with Sports England and the applicant on, on proposed mitigation measures for the potential loss of the Grade C facility at the Camero site. At its meeting on Tuesday the 23rd of September, the Council's Development Control Committee refused two planning applications for the Camrose land. The discussion to refuse the planning application was taken on the basis that the development would have resulted in the loss of valued facility at the Camrose Stadium without the provision or equivalent or better replacement facilities. Contrary to the local planning policy, CN8, the committee also asked had concerns around the development of the site and the lack of a, 
a legal agreement securing developer contributions toward replacement community facilities and local infrastructure. The future of the Camero site is still uncertain and the applicant could appeal his deci this decision. Any appeal would be considered by the planning inspectorate. It is the responsibility of the private owner of the Camero site to provide suitable mitigation for the loss of the facility. The council's position that it would not be appropriate to allocate taxpayers' money to the current owner through the purchase and ongoing responsibility of the Camero site. As well as the cost to purchase the Camero's facility, short-term investment would be needed immediately to ensure it is fit for purpose and long-term ongoing investment would be, sorry, long-term ongoing investment would be required to maintain this. We are aware that the clubs, we are aware that clubs across the country are struggling with finances as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and therefore may have limited capacity to support the ongoing liabilities of this type of facility. The council's limited resources further impacted by COVID-19 pandemic our resources must be directed to support the continued provision of essential services for all of our residents and towards the achievement of, a, of all council plan priorities. The council's priorities, as all, the council's priority has always been to undertake improvement works at Winklebury to support the club's vision to return to the borough. As a result, we have continued to show our commitment to, the, to sports clubs across the borough and important work they do in helping our residents stay active. This is reflected in the level of support that has been provided to enable the club to play at Winklebury. Over the last five years, significant investment has been made on sports facilities across the borough, including improvements at Downgrange, supporting the installation of new 3G pitches at Winklebury, uh, Downgrange, the Vine, the Hurst and Testbourne schools, and the Fieldgate Centre, as well as it, investment in facilities at Basing Sports Sport Centre, the Aquadrome, Tadley Leisure Centre and Basing Stoke Golf Centre. So that was a statement from the council. And I've also got a, um, an article from uh, Basing Stoke Town Community Football Club, which I will read out. Basing Stoke Town Football Club are delighted to announce that the Winklebury Sports Complex has passed a Southern League ground grading, which will enable us to play home games at the at, back in Basingstoke. We'd like to thank everyone who's made it pos this possible and to our fans for the patience and support they have shown in getting us back to our town. It's been a long and sometimes frustrating process. However, playing back in the town is a huge step for the club's survival, which will allow us to build stepping stones to establish a brighter future. Of course, while we are delighted to be getting back to the town, our ongoing fight for a true light-for-light -light replacement of our once iconic stadium will continue. And now with greater assurance of our future, with our return to Basingstoke will provide a more solid foundation to fight the corner of the community. The protected gift to the community of Basingstoke and sport more widely has given a boost recently with proposals dismissed due to the distinct lack of clear planning, foresight and regard for the community. Today's news will allow us to truly showcase just how much this club can mean to its community and what the community means to this club. That in itself should provide another key reason amongst the whole host of many to right the wrongs of the Camero scandal. Playing back in Basingstoke has handed your club a lifeline and also an opportunity to truly work with our community, having already established a women's team, girls team and links to the local youth club. We are already seeing that come to fruition. This news also allows us the opportunity to thank everybody at Winchester City Football Club for making their facility available to us to, and welcoming us to their ground, a gesture what will, that will live long in, in our history. It has allowed us to keep the club, al club alive and provided a home away from home in the process. We'd also like to thank Reading City Football Club for their recent use of the ground in our FA Cup win versus Bournemouth Football Club. We would also like to thank everybody at Amch FA for their cooperation in, in heading up 
the operation and Paul Martin for his help and support. Town fans, we are back at Basingstoke. We cannot wait to welcome you to the Winkleberry Stadium on the 24th of October against a much fancied title chaser, AFC Totten. And I'd like to wish them good luck with that. Does anybody want to um, add, add to that? Yes, please, Chairman. Yeah, Councillor Jones. Yeah, um, I don't know when you've got these papers, especially from the council. It would have been nice for us councillors who are on this committee to actually have them, to read them, to, to see you've read them out fine, but nice to study, see what is actually being said, because there's, there's a long old statement the council has made. Yeah, well, that, I, that, as a committee member, I feel we're not being. If I'm really honest, it's it's like being bypassed again. We're the ones who raise these issues. Yeah, and we're all no, on that trying stuff now. There's no reason why we shouldn't have had that, that those statements sent to us so we could have read them prior to this meeting. It would right. have given us an insight to what's going on, and I've written some stuff down. But in in it, it's, you know, it might be fine and good, but for but it was nice to have read it. And I would say the same. Good luck to Ways and Stoke. I hope they've I mean, achieved what they're after. But I think there's still a lot of questions out there to be answered, if I'm honest with you. I don't yeah. think it's the end of the thing. But I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Yeah, no, I completely understand. The, the statement was something that I asked for. It wasn't going to be on the, the agenda, but there was a, you know, we, we had a lengthy discussion and I felt a little bit disappointed at the last meeting because we didn't get anywhere because obviously the development control meeting was, was coming up. Uh, so I just really wanted it as a, as a statement to where we are now, um, capture the history that's gone on and, and just make that statement because it's something I want to follow through the six months before, um, you know, an appeal can take place. So I, I just want to keep on top of the uh, top of the matter really and let this committee know that we are on top of it. So that, that it, it is my fault. It wasn't on the agenda. I forced it. So I apologise for not, not giving, getting that out to you. I don't think it was a dig at yours, Owen. I, mean, I think in general we should have heard it anyway, but it's not yours, Chairman. You've yeah. done what you need to do. Fine. Thank I've you. got no problem with that. Thank you. Any more questions? So there's another item, which, uh, again, I make apologies for. Um, I'll, I'll read the statement because it's, uh, it tells it's, it's not as lengthy as the last one, so bear with me. So this is a, a statement by um, the, well, for me, but it's by David Corville, who's interim head of Borough Development and Implementation. The committee work programme included an item on, on this agenda concerning the modernisation of hospitals and health infrastructure projects. I've agreed not to consider a, a report tonight, but instead receive a report at our next meeting on the 16th of December. The reason for this is that Hampshire Hospitals Foundation Trust is due to publish its strategic online business case for investment in health facilities, including a new hospital in early December. As well as being able to consider the recommendations, representatives of the Trust have agreed to attend the committee to explain more about the proposals and to answer members' questions. I am sure members are aware of the Prime Minister's recent announcement, which indicated that a new hospital will be built in Basingstoke and Dean. Whilst that is very a very positive step, it is important to note that the proposals to be, to be announced in early December will be subject to a public consultation commencing in January. Also that the recommendations in the business case will go beyond the delivery of a new hospital and consider ways in which health services can improve the delivery at a more local level. This is a subject very much within the remit of the committee and again a reason for considering a report in December once the Trust has published its proposals and with its representatives in attendance. So again I apologise for that but I just felt it would be better to, to put that into December so we can ask some proper questions. So I will move on to item five now. So this is an update briefing note for the ice rink. Uh, our contact officer is Kate Dean and I, I will hand over to Kate uh, to introduce the item. Kate. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, at the time of writing, we uh, did not have any update from Planet Ice uh, in terms of the scope of works that had been requested. Uh, I am pleased to report, however, that that information did come into officers on Friday. Uh, it is now uh, being reviewed uh, internally and with our team of uh, technical consultants. Okay, so um, so I'm guessing Friday to now, you've probably not had a chance to, to digest that uh, report. That's right, Chair. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on to um, our guest speakers. Uh, we First of all, we've got um, Sally Cashman. Is Sally available? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Sally. Hi. Uh, normal rules apply. You have uh, two minutes to speak and um, when you're ready to start. Thank you very much. I've recently discovered that some of the com couples competing on ITV's Dancing on Ice are training at Basingstoke Ice Rink. It's amazing to think that once again our ice rink has some of the best figure skaters in the world using it. But how much longer will it be an ice rink? Are this committee aware that there is a clause in the lease with standard securities that allows them to seek a change of use on the ice rink building from April 2021? Are they also aware that there have already been discussions between Planet Ice and standard securities about turning off the plant and closing the rink before the summer of 2021 if a solution cannot be found to repairing the ice rink? What power if any, does this council or Basin, does this committee, sorry, or Basingstoke and Dean Borough Council have to stop this happening? I'd also add that Hull Council have recently agreed to fund repairs to the ice rink in Hull so that they still have an ice rink while they are waiting for a new one to be built. If Hull City Council have the foresight to invest in the future, can this council, will this council do the same? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I hand that over to officers, the question? Uh, in terms of uh, how we understand that that is owned by the council uh, at Basingstoke, the asset is owned by private investors. In terms of the variation of the user clause uh, in the lease, uh, that is correct, that there are provisions in the lease for uh, the operator to apply to the council for a change of use. Does that, uh, does that answer your question, Sally? Um, Sort of, yes. I wasn't aware they had to apply to the council to apply for the change of use, but that just might be a gap in my understanding. But I did actually ask if the committee were aware. I'm, I'm sure Kate would have been aware, but were the committee aware that that could happen as soon as summer 2021? Well, before I hand it over to the committee, um, we've got another guest speaker, uh, Heath Rhodes. So can I ask Heath to, to speak? Heath, are you available? Hello. Hi, Heath. How are you? Uh, normal rules apply. You, you have two minutes to, to speak. And when okay. you're ready to start. Uh, firstly, uh, we were in conference via email with Kate Dean on the 6th of October. Um, we would made it clear before that that we would get a scope over and a schedule of uh, the works by the end of October. It was made clear to us on the 6th that the chair of the CAP had requested it for this meeting on the 21st. Um, we managed to get the scope together. I'm sure you appreciate it, it was very detailed, um, trying to get the information with, with contractors in the state they are at the moment is quite difficult. 
but um, really my question tonight was to ensure whether the CEP actually had the uh, scope as requested. We wasn't aware until the 6th that it had been requested by the uh, chair. Uh, but it seems that you haven't. My apologies, it did come in first thing on the Friday morning. I think with the restrictions that have been in place, uh, we did quite well to produce a detailed report. It would have been useful to have had the report that's generated by Basing Stoke Council shared, that was the topic of the previous conversation, but that was declined on the 21st of last month by Jonathan Bannum. Um, we've also asked and put in a request that Basing State Council make a contribution towards the uh, scope, which may go some way to answering Sally Cashman's question. And we are awaiting an answer, which I believe will be submitted by Kate uh, to their members on the 26th. That's it. Sorry. Sorry, thanks for that. Uh, so I'll hand over to councillors. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, sorry, councillor Kim Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, officers, for and everybody else for, for the up updates and, and, and contributions. Um, we're obviously where we are. We've got some bits coming in. I think it would be uh, really helpful if the next meeting report was a very detailed and updated one. Um, it's, it's a long time since we asked for copies of reports and we haven't had, had any. So even if we can't have the whole ones, I think we ought to be able to have summary ones or they could at least be copied uh, uh, to councillors on emails uh, on a confidential basis if necessary. So I do think we are due a detailed update with uh, either the reports or the essence of the reports, plus the scope of the uh, repairs and maintenance that are required. Um, and um, also, I think perhaps it might well be that we have to ask the portfolio holder uh, to come and join the meeting um, to answer some of these questions that relate more to sort of policy than getting on with the work which the officers would would be involved with. One of those has been um, touched on by, by Mr Rhodes and by Sally about whether or not the council will or will not make a, a, a payment or a contribution or provide any assistance towards the costs. And I am of course aware that uh, we've always been told as a committee that that's not possible because of state aid and that it's also not possible because it's not the council's policy to support or subsidize private businesses. But of course, things have changed somewhat. Uh, we have had cabinet decisions where um, it's been agreed that money could be given to a private company, Serco, to bolster up some losses that they made during COVID. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, state aid wasn't considered at that that point and and also there has been some change in attitude towards contributing to private companies so I think those are policy issues that we would need the portfolio holder to come and talk to us about and, and explain um, and also perhaps um, some because it is very relevant a bit of an update on what's actually happening in in the um leisure park itself because that, that's been very silent and I appreciate there's been COVID and everything else to deal with but I do think we need to know where that's going if it's moving on because what happens with that also has impact on some of the other issues that Sally has mentioned for example um, what happens if if um, standard uh, securities and um, whoever's running the ice rink um, decide to just pull the pug and walk away from it um, you know how does that fit in with the compulsory purchase arrangements that were originally you know considered uh, in terms of how how we would be progressing ahead and so on so I think there's quite a detailed review that's that's due 
excuse me, um, partly on all the technical things to do with reports, the, you know, how much is, you know, what is the extent of the repairing and, and so on, but also, you know, what what contribution we're going to make and, and what impact possible, you know, change of use might have and, and where we are with the leisure rink uh, generally, a bit waffly, and I apologise for that. That's no worry. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in answer to the uh, first speaker's question about was the council, was the committee aware of the possibility of turning off the lease? Um, I certainly wasn't aware, uh, but I understand the lease was actually agreed by a previous administration, so I, I don't have access to that I wasn't around at the time. Um, but my question really is, what would be the incentive for anybody to turn off the lease? Presumably Planet Ice want to continue to be a, 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 an ice, um, you know, to make their money from ice rinks. And similarly, standard securities wouldn't have any incentives to terminate the lease anyway, because the only reason for it would be to use the land for something else. And given the plans for, uh, for the leisure park, um, I can't see that they would be incentivized to do that, but maybe I'm missing a point. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of the, uh, the lease as well. So, um, it, you know, it's new to me as well. Uh, any more questions? Councillor Cousins. Thank you, Chair. Um, addressing um, Sally Cashman's point, initially I did not know, but it was only because of a Facebook post on the ICE users Facebook forum that I asked to check what the state of play was and there or thereabouts what you've outlined is correct and Kate has said that that is that is the position that should an application come through to change um, the ice rink from one leisure facility into another there are some remits in terms of what you know if that it might not be permitted but by and large if an application came through to change it it could be allowed Kate will scream at me if I've got that horrendously wrong, but that was my understanding of what the contract was saying. Um, ultimately, though, one of the questions I've got here is why is the portfolio not here answering questions? He told this committee last time that this is his brief. He's looking after it. He's managing it. He wants to get involved with it and he wants to find the solutions. He said he was going to do everything that he could to help keep the ice rink here in Basingstoke. He's not graced us with his presence here tonight, which I think screams volumes, not only to us as a committee, but also to the ice rink users. I also think it screams volumes. That he's not here again, wanting to try and find a solution. Likewise, I think it's a little bit remiss that the portfolio holder has not advised the wider committee that this clause was in place. And in essence, there is a bit of a deadline here that we've got to try and find and resolve answers to long before that comes into place. Specifically to Kate, I know that the reports only came in on Friday. But from the last meeting we had, we had indications that any repairs could take anywhere between sort of 6, 12, 18 months. Have those reports given any indication as to how long those repairs could take, even if it's just back of an envelope or guidance that you could give us now? Because depending on those timescales, we might have to find a temporary rink for those ice rink users, and we should be discussing that now rather than waiting yet another month to even consider those elements. Uh, Councillor Cousins, I've, I've read the report and it doesn't contain a programme. Councillor Cousins, do you, do you have anything further to add? Um, Okay, so then I suppose I go back to the last meeting, which is where we said repairs could take six months. Where So I suppose the question mark is, how long is this going to take? Let's get down to brass tacks. How long is this going to take? Is it going to take another two years if everything fell into place within the next month or so? Is it going to take six months? Either way, potentially, we're going to have to find a new home for the bison, for the figure skaters, for all the other ice rink clubs that go on there. And yet we are to sleep at the wheel in trying to help and find a result and find solutions here. And for whatever reason, 
the administration seem quite happy to let that happen. And I don't understand why. The ice rink users don't understand why. They're frustrated. I'm frustrated. Other members of the committee are frustrated. And yet we seem to be sleepwalking into this element of we're going to find ourselves in a similar position to the football club where it's all going to get very last minute dot com. And then all of these things are going to come out in the wash of, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. I really not want to wait until the last minute. I'd rather we got stuff in motion now that we could actually show that we're doing something. This just sort of looks as if at the moment it's a bit of tokenism of, yeah, we'll see what we can do, but we're not going to commit to anything yet. We'll think about it. We'll do some more research. Honestly, at some point that doesn't wash and I think we're pretty much there. Okay, do you want to respond to that? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, Councillor Cousins, just in terms of, of timing, uh, I have been encouraging Planet Ice, if they have any requests of the council, to make them to me in writing. So uh, that can then be the basis of a discussion with the relevant portfolio holders. Uh, um, as of this morning, uh, as, as Mr Rhodes has said earlier, uh, there was a sort of a, a general request about uh, the council making a contribution. Um, progress relies entirely really on, on planet ice. Um, and, and as I say, we, we have encouraged that uh, conversation uh, and, and that, that's where we are as of this evening. Okay, can I move on to Councillor Tony Jones? Thank you, Chair. Just an answer to Sally. No, I didn't know as a councillor. Well, that's not unusual. I don't think this day and age, we, you know, if you're not in the cabinet, you don't seem to get the information, but that's just my little dig. Um, well, what I would say is that we've, we've got major problems in this town with our policy, our sports policy, and it's about we, perhaps we as a committee should start looking at it. Because what we're actually saying, we've got problems with our football team, we've got problems with this. They're all privately owned or community owned. You know, is that right? Is it working? It seems to everything seems to be falling around our ears because we've let other people run these things instead of actually running them from Basingstoke itself or having a, a bigger say in it. Not necessarily 100%, but we should have had a say in a lot of these things. And it's perhaps something we should be looking at, and I'd like to see that in the near future that we look at policy, what, what is actually happening here, because policy is actually failing, in my view, the people of Basingstoke. Thank you. Anybody else? So I don't have anybody else to speak. Um, there's a few things there. Obviously the report um, only came on Friday. It's normal practice to allow two weeks to collate comments and stuff in the council. So I can understand nobody wants to comment on it just yet. Hopefully we will have that, and I'd like to request it now officially that we, we get to see the, the report before the next, um, the next meeting. And uh, I'd like, also like to request a full update uh, for the for next meeting in December, I think it is. Um, so we, we've, we've talked about uh, the whole um, ice rink that's council owned, so it's not a private uh, investor. And... Um, we, we also talked about uh, what partly what was in in the report, but I don't really want to, to go into that because it's not uh, it's not fair. On, yeah, to chairman, you comment on it. I think Councillor Cousins is waving at you. Sorry, Councillor Cousins. Sorry, Chair. I was just going to say, in the interest of openness and fairness, I think committee members should be able to see the documentation that Sally Cashman alluded to about what provisions could be in place if Planet Ice or uh, Standard Securities want to change the use of the ice ring. I think that has to be out in the open, seeing as it's been discussed tonight. Okay, uh, well, we can put that request in. Okay, so... Um... Sorry, Chair. Um, can we also request that the portfolio holder turns up, please, and answer some of these questions? I will request a full full update at the next meeting and I will expect the portfolio order to turn up for that. So um, after that, we'll move on to item six. Item five, we've noted the update. 
So item six is the local emergency community response to COVID-19. Uh, our contact officer is Daniel Garnier, but I'd like to hand over to Ian Ball to introduce the subject. Ian, are you available? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Just about, yeah. Okay, all good. Um, so I just thought I'd give a very quick introduction to this report uh, and really what has been a whirlwind over the last eight months. So if we cast our minds back to mid-March, um, just pre-crisis, um, de delivering a service to support the vulnerable of Basingstoke in this manner was not something that we were doing at all. Um, we had a resource of zero allocated towards COVID recovery and community hub establishment at that particular point in time. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say that globally, nobody knew very much at all about what COVID meant or what was going on. And nationally, um, <clears throat> that was a case similar as well as everyone was trying to understand the situation. Um, uh, and from that, uh, the report that we present to you today summarises the amount of work that um, the Council went into to establish those community hubs to support community organisations providing support to vulnerable within their own patches, um, to support organisations in getting um, food, medicine and other services to vulnerable people of the borough and um, in those early stages of that crisis it was a team that was always ahead of the emerging picture coming out nationally coming out regionally and being cascaded down through the local resilience forum um, principally because of the proactivity of the teams and the interconnectivity it had with the communities to understand what was going on and being able to respond um, but I just wanted to use that opportunity really to sort of cast everybody's mind back six months to the start of this. Um, and, and Daniel will fill in with everything that happened thereafter. But it was a particularly challenging time at the start of the, of the um, crisis period in mid-March. And um, I would just like to thank the officers and all of the people, in fact, who helped out during all of that extensive period during what was a very challenging time. So over to Daniel. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, uh, councillors. Um, thank you for the opportunity to kind of give you an overview or an update on the community hub work that's uh, happened in the response. As Ian said, I think I would like to invite you to cast your mind back to late February, early March, um, when cases were starting to rise in the UK. At that time, nobody really knew what the impact of the pandemic would be on communities and businesses. Um, however, it became clear uh, very quickly that the council would need to respond and react fast. Um, the council activated this pandemic flu plan and we set up structures to manage the emergency response. Um, the strategic emergency management team and subgroups were established um, to coordinate the council's response to ensure we continue to provide essential services and to support our residents and businesses. Um, at the same time, we also saw uh, residents coming together and setting up some local volunteer hubs to support their neighbours. Working closely with BVA, uh, the council quickly established a local model to support our vulnerable residents. And about within a week, really, um, the community hub was set up and started operating on the 20th of March. The role, the role of the hub was to respond to requests for support, to refer local residents to the support available locally, coordinate the work of the various local hubs and provide advice and guidance to local voluntary and community organizations. An inquiry team made up of council staff was set up to deal with the requests coming in from local residents, but also the referrals from the Hampshire, Hampshire County helpline. A network of 28 local hubs operated across the borough, uh, which got provided coverage in both urban and rural areas. The council and BVA worked very closely together to support these hubs um, and enable coordination and also ensuring that they had access to the right level of guidance and support. Uh, regular contact, free weekly telephone calls was maintained throughout the emergency response. This call aimed up to capture information and data on levels of demand and the sort of requests that were uh, coming in as well, discuss any challenges or issues and provide updates to the uh, additional guidance to the hubs and the volunteers. Um, given the high levels of demand, the council also recognized that some financial assistance would be required. 
Um, the council launched a grant scheme and made 200,000 pounds available to support local community groups. Uh, in total, we supported 25 organizations and uh, allocated 196,000 pounds of, of funding. Um, there was other support provided as well. Uh, council staff collected food, uh, food orders from supermarkets to deliver to the local hubs. We supplied PPE and hand sanitizing gel. We signposted to other sources of support and funding and also um, supported the, um, the hubs with applying for funding and also kind of enabled some bulk food orders to be distributed to local hubs. Between March and July, we received 1,700 requests for support. And at the heart of the pandemic, sort of probably in March and April, we were receiving up to 350 requests per week. Um, and at the height as well, we had about 40 staff involved in manning the hub and responding to calls. The, the nature of complexity of the, the request varied greatly, um, as did the, the length of calls. And sometimes the call could last 10 minutes, sometimes it could last up to two hours. The majority of requests received were around access to food and, and medicine, um, but there was also support provided around kind of doing food shopping for people, delivery of food parcels, collecting prescriptions, befriending services, welfare checks, mental and physical well-being support, as well as financial advice and guidance. Uh, communication was really important. We needed to make sure that our residents had access to, to the latest guidance and where to find information. That was done through a range of, of um, measures. We had uh, information in all the council tax bills, kind of giving information on where to access support and the, the, the Hampshire Light number. We did regular updates to the council web pages. We had some social media campaigns. Um, we also did various press releases to local media, radio and community magazines. We had some templates that we circulated to the local hubs so that they could actually use those to kind of do sort of door to door, um, uh, I'd say flight posting, not flight tipping, sorry. So door to door um, information um, um, sharing with their, with their residents. We had some posters made as well. And we also ran a five week advertising campaign on the Breeze radio station. Um, it was really important as part of the process that we took stock and kind of reviewed how the community hub performed overall. Uh, and you know what lessons could be learned for any future kind of planning. Uh, we had some debrief sessions, we had regular contacts with the hubs and also did some snap surveys to kind of capture that information intelligence. Um, in terms of kind of key lessons, really the operating model that we had locally of having a community hub coordinating sort of a, a network of local hubs ensured that we had coverage across the whole borough. Uh, it did mean at times though that there might have been sort of duplication of effort and, and some confusion, uh, but I think over time with kind of more robust triaging and, uh, and tracking referrals, we were going to reduce that, that duplication and, and confusion. Um, the model, I think, also helped build better connections and partnership working between the various community groups, the council and BVA, which I think is a kind of very strong outcome of the um, of the model. Um, as guidance and information change very frequently, um, particularly at the start, it was quite difficult sometimes to keep up with it. Um, and I think some hubs sort of felt they were kind of inundated with information and guidance. So we adjusted kind of this approach and kind of moved to a weekly update to all the hubs kind of with the latest guidance and information and where to access support. Um, there was also, I think, a need to differentiate between the emergency, emergency sorry, the emergency need for, for support and the longer term needs. And I think, you know, this kind of be done kind of a different triaging and referral processes. And I'll say as well, I think the type of request we, and residents, you know, our, our residents kind of found themselves kind of varied greatly. And, you know, over time we were able kind of to refine the process, ask the right questions, and then be able basically to kind of signpost people to the right route for, for support. Um, the running of the community hub obviously relies heavily on, on council, BVF staff, and also volunteers. And I think, you know, for us, it's really important that we're able to plan effectively in terms of capacity and as well foresee any potential issues and kind of put measures in place. Um, in terms of planning for the future, so um, as of August, the, the, the hub has been run by BVA. At the moment, it's all very quiet, I have to say. Uh, BVA receives about kind of, you know, one or two inquiries a week, uh, but we are conscious, you know, that the landscape might change. You know, there is potential for Basingstoke and Dean to, to move into local lockdown at some stage or kind of move into a higher tier of, of risk. So, um, you know, we are planning for this. The community hub hasn't stopped, you know, it's still in operation and people are still able to access support. Um, 
And I think, you know, in terms of kind of responding to another lockdown situation, we'll be able to redeploy council staff to uh, reactivate the local hubs. Some have stepped down at the moment, but they've all indicated that they're happy to kind of to, to, to step up again and also provide some financial support, you know, should need be, because we've been given some funding by, by DEFRA to support the efforts. Um, we expect um, the nature of support requests to be different um, with less of an, a focus on emergency um, access to food, for example, but more around hardship and long-term financial difficulties. And, you know, to, to, to work on that, we are working closely with BVA, Citizen Advice and, and the Food Bank. And we have kind of a, a specific triaging pr process to refer people that in those circumstances to have access to, to long, longer term help. Um, I would like to end this brief overview by uh, saying that the borough should be very proud of how it responded to the crisis. And by borough, I, I, I mean the council, but also BVA and all the local voluntary organizations and groups and the hundreds of volunteers that uh, rose to the challenge and demonstrated an incredible amount of kindness and support. I appreciate it wasn't all perfect and there were some issues, particularly at the start, but we learned a lot along the way and were able to make improvements. And I think we need to remember, as Ian said, that uh, we had to work in very challenging and difficult times with a great deal of uncertainty and constant changes as well in guidance and expectations. And finally, I would like to kind of end this quick overview by thanking you councillors for your help and support for referring kind of residents to the local hub and sharing information with their communities. But also thank all those council staff that supported the community hub, BVA and all the volunteers and groups that provided and continue to provide support to our residents. Thank you very much. And I think you now if there's any kind of comments or questions. Thank you. I mean, um, I'd like to reflect that, uh, that thanks as well, obviously, um, the councillors and uh, general public and all, all, all everybody's assistance in this in this uh, situation. Uh, so I'd just like to hand over, anybody got comments or any questions? So Councillor Tony Jones and I've got Councillor Mahaffey after. Well, for once I'm not complaining. <laughs> now I, I think what we, it's, it's congratulations all around to be fair and I think we should really as councillors recognise that, that the work's done was done under an emergency procedures and everything else. And I think all fair play to Basin Stoke, we've got a great lot of people living there. And I think we ought to ref try and reflect that because it just it wasn't just in one area, it was across the borough. And that to me is something that should be sort of cheered about at the top of the houses because we seem, sometimes seem to lose our way as Basin Stoke's got bigger. But this just proved that uh, Oasis Stoke is a great place to live. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Ian, you got a comment? Thank you, Chair. I was just going to come back because I think Daniel forgot to mention that we did hold over August the big thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and we did, <laughs> we did finish, if you like, um, on that higher note of... Um, acknowledging the many, many, many individuals and organisations, uh, officers and others that had all supported uh, this response during that period. So um, we did do that as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mahaffey. It's actually already been said, Chair. I just wanted to put on record my congratulations and, and admiration for officers uh, throughout the crisis. We've distributed money faster than I think any other council in the country. Uh, the coordination has been fantastic with BVA, the hub. Um, I just hope that the rest of the committee could uh, could recognise that as well. I'm sure we do. Yeah, I agree. Um, Councillor Box. You're on mute, Sorry. I think. Yeah, I know. My computer just wouldn't it flicked on and flicked off again so I apologize for the delay so yeah I, I echo other people's uh, comments about the massive task and the complexity of it um, cannot be underestimated because it was very new um, to all of us and, and uh, every community was different uh, it was very complex to map everything and make sense of it and and you know that the, our, our council colleagues um, and uh, the BVA did a, a Herculean ta task getting it sorted out. It, it was massive. Um, so, you know, we're in a good place and we've got lots of information. We've got networks. We now use technology a, a lot better. 
Um, and, and I think there's a, a lot of positive learning. But I think there were two things that I don't think the report pulled out um, quite um, as well as I, I, I thought it might. So one was around information and one's around community centres. So the information, I appreciate in the report that stuff came out, oh, I think it said March the 20th. Um, actually, that was a bit late. Um, a lot of community groups needed to have information out before lockdown even happened. And in February and early March, they knew something was going to happen and they were trying to get leaflets out, leaflets delivered, um, and they were looking anywhere really for, for a source of information for templates and, and everything. So um, eventually when it did come out, it was superb. Everybody has said to me how good the information that came out was, but it was just a bit late for most of the community groups. They'd already got stuff done. So what I think would be great is if the learning, one of the issues of learning could be that when we can see something that's going to happen like this, that we try and step things up a bit earlier so that those community groups have got access to um, uh, information templates, leaflet templates, that kind of thing earlier. It, it could have been a month earlier, I think, and that would have been superb. It would have helped such a lot of people. Um, and then community centres, um, they did such a lot of good work during this lockdown. And even now, you know, they were often the natural community hub for their community, um, but they, they are struggling and they need financial support. So some of them shut down and they put their staff on furlough and they still got some financial help from the council to keep them going. There were other community centres, Tadley being one of them, where they kept open, they didn't furlough the manager, they kept them uh, uh, paid their wages, and that community centre in Tadley became the hub. Um, Tadley is very fortunate that it has loads of community groups, but it, it also caused some clashes because there were multiple groups all trying to help. And in the end, it needed the cohesion of, of the community centre to actually get everybody together, to actually get coordination across Tadley working effectively. And the community centre was a good repository for, for storage, for food supplies. Um, and so the, the community centre became the, the hub for Tadley. Um, massive resource but actually financially it's worse off because it did that because it kept open and it kept paying the wages of the manager now you know if we want our community centers to be that active resource in our communities we need to support them better I think um, and I wonder whether some of that DEFRA money that has been allocated to us could be considered for some of those centres that did stay open and incurred additional costs um, because, I mean, it looks like they're not going to get income community centres for about a year because they can't, you know, all of these hospitality things have been put on hold. So there's, you know, the, re the income has reduced enormously. So I just wonder whether um, the council could think about uh, allocating some of the monies that they've got to help those community centres that stayed open when actually they didn't need to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, is it worth adding to that? Um, obviously, we're going into a period where it, uh, it may kick off again. It's likely to kick off again. I think there was um, three people in Basingstoke Hospital last week with uh, COVID-19 um, issues and I've been told there's eight this week. Um, obviously it's starting again. Are, are we in a position now to just kick it off? Yeah, uh, Daniel. 
if I may share, I'll be able to kind of pick up some of the points Council of all kind of raised. I mean, completely take your point about kind of the, 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 the fastness of response and providing information. The challenge we had at the time is that we weren't kind of quite clear what the Council or, or you know, what the expectations were at the time. I think, you know, when I said the community was set up on the 20th of March, there was some work happening before that, you know, communicating, liaising with the group. So I think, you know, it, not, it didn't all kick start on the 20th of March, but I think, you know, something that we've learned absolutely. And now we're in a much better place, you know, to be able to provide information of ahead of um, of anything happening and, and in answer to your question councillor gaskell i think we are constantly monitoring the situation we look at data on a daily basis kind of seeing we you know what what the local picture is so that we're able kind of to to kick start and, and step up things again you know ahead of any sort of um kind of you know local lockdown or, or kind of um, moving up to to, le um, to level to a tier two or three um on the community centre uh, kind of aspect, uh, Council of I mean, as part of the grant funding we made available, community centres could actually apply to some part of the funding to help them sort of remaining open. So I think the funding was not just all about, you know, buying food or, or PP. There was kind of an element of it, you know, supporting community centres with their kind of running costs as well while they were while they were open during the um, the crisis. Um, the DEFRA funding, unfortunately, is ring fenced for very specific uses. And it's very much about kind of emergency assistance and and, and food supply and, and and that sort of thing. So we can't really use that funding to support community centres, unfortunately. Uh, Council Vox. Thanks, uh, Daniel, very much for, for your answer. So if DEFRA funding isn't um, available for it, please can the council have a, um, a consider, I mean, this is a rich council, comparatively speaking, um, and these community centres are, are really a massive resource for our communities. It would be tragic if they started to fall over. Um, I mean, their running costs are pretty minimal when you think about it in the great scheme of things. It's not massive amounts of money. So I, I would ask that um, we think carefully about how we can support them to remain open because they do add such huge value. Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, uh, I'll let Ian sort of respond on the kind of the, the funding side of things. But in terms of support, you know, the uh, connected communities team is kind of in daily contact with community centres, kind of supporting them on a day to day basis with with advice, guidance, kind of how kind of to tap into other sources of funding as well. So, you know, that that sort of support is is there at the moment. Um, Next, I have uh, Councillor Ian Taylor. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just uh, I mean, I think Councillor Vox has made many of the points I'd make. I, I think initially when they were set up, most of these organisations, certainly the Overton ones, and I believe the Witcher's one, were set up completely independent of anybody, and they weren't even aware of BVA. And of course, the trouble is they use initials like BVA, and we know it means Bainsack Voluntary Action, but what is that something to do with Basingstoke? You know, so why would anyone in Overton even look to it? So. We do know now, or we, well, I knew, but they didn't, you know, and so we could point them in the right direction. But I think that's something that needs to be looked at is what is the role of BVA? Is it a borough organisation? Is it a wider area? You know, it is, you know, it's one of these sort of odd sort of organisations that's sort of grown over the years and it's got its own base, but it's unclear what its role in the borough is, you know, relative to the borough. But I think that, you know, it, that's all been sort of dealt with. Everyone knows who it is now, the ones who set these things up. And if it happens again, we know where we are. But I think for future, because if something else comes along that's different, we could end up in the same situation. But I, 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 again, well, but other than that, given where what's happened, which is unprecedented, I think the response has been very good. But I wanted to thank Daniel, particularly, he didn't mention the work he did with the, um, the local business associations, because... In Oven, we're quite lucky. We've got quite a big district centre. We've got a co-op, butcher, baker. We've got a very good green grocers as well. The biggest problem we've got is the footpaths are barely a metre wide. So asking people to social distance was means walking in the road. So Daniel provided us with a load of signs all around. We've got all around the village saying, you know, beware of people in the road uh, because it's not what you expect if you're racing through over. And at least it's and it's certainly hell. We've not had anyone run over, so that's a obviously a plus point. But those are the sort of things you know we've been very good at helping with and and things like cleaning stations that sort of thing to get these district centers up and running again because 
again, it, you know, it's it's problematic. If you've got people queuing outside your shop, they take the pavement up, you know, then no one can walk by without walking in the road, which you probably do anyway. But when you've got far more people using the local shop, so it's been a bonus for them and just so it keeps it up. So, but I think the response is, you know, I mean, it could have been a lot worse. We, we were pretty lucky. We've not been hit there. I and mean, you look at what's going on in the north of England now, you think, and if that's said in this way, then things are going to get very interesting down here pretty soon, I think, aren't they? But at least we're, we've got, you know, we've been through it once. We know what we can achieve. So I think that's the good thing. We've had a good dry, we've got a good dry run in our respect. So uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Ian. Thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you, Councillor Tilbury. It's good to hear yet another example of where Daniel has um, gone above and beyond and done something further for a community. Um, I suppose I just wanted to add in terms of one of the lessons learned from our perspective is that is that when a community or indeed ourselves didn't know anything, that's a very long time period or it feels like it is. Um, as soon as you do get an understanding of what's going on and what information you have got to cascade, I think we did it as quickly as we possibly could. Um, but I, I take both of the points that um, all have raised that um, that uncertainty period is the period where you, you desperately want information, but we didn't necessarily have any or know quite what accurately to cascade. And the issue we had as officers as well was uh, not wishing to issue conflicting information because we had a absolute minefield of information to go through to understand what was correct, what was accurate and what wasn't. Um, I think, you know, I was regularly receiving the best part of a thousand emails a day, all containing something that related to the COVID problem and filtering some of that was, was definitely a bit of a challenge. Uh, Daniel. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Tilbury, just kind of to pick up on your point of BV, I mean, it is a borough-wide organisation, it's not, not just based on focus, and I think one of the uh, the positive outcomes, actually, I would say, of the um, the, the, the community hub response, that uh, that's enabled kind of BVA to build much better and closer relationships with all of their different local local groups, and I think, you know, there was a debrief session last week, I believe, and I think um, all really valued, I think, you know, that kind of networking and that kind of support provided by BV, and, and they all want to actually carry on with that networking and kind of Creating some community connectors. So I think you know that's definitely one of the positive outcomes, kind of raising the profile of BVA and the level they're able to, the, sorry, the support they're able to provide to a range of community and 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 then voluntary sector organisations in, in, in the borough. Thank you, uh, Councillor Colin Regan. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just uh, go back to what Council Falk said. That 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 was my experience with uh, my community centre, West Side. It was uh, them uh, who got up and running and could become the centre of things. And uh, and there's a uh, um, the uh, Council Falk's experience is exactly mirrored by Alan as well. So uh, he, what worries me if you get a second wave, which it could be coming. The, the, the uh, community centres could be under great strain. Yeah, the, I know I appreciate there was funding and I did apply for and I did get, but ongoing for the next six months, it, it is a, could be a real problem. If there's a second wave, as my centre manager just said to me last week, if there's a second shutdown, they could go under as, as a community centre. So that is a, a, real, a, 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 a deep worry. So I'd like to put that on the up on the agenda. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'd lost my sound for a moment. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just really wanted to, to thank everybody for the, uh, the work they've done, the community officers and, and absolutely everybody. It's a, it's a really good, a, an excellent effort in, in all, all of the circumstances. Um, also, I'd like to agree with um, Councillor Vaux and, and, and Councillor Regan that if we don't take some kind of imaginative action to keep our community centres open, they're not going to be there 
when we need them for these kinds of, uh, of events. And, and they are struggling because they it's not just the fact that they're not there and the groups that normally would use them could, could use them, but also quite a lot of our community centres have a wet bar that, that normally people would have been going into, um, you know, after work or weekends and so on. And, and that would earn income as well. Quite often those are run sort of separate and apart from the normal community bit. And I think they're... I worry in case there were lost opportunities for community centres to have applied for two sets of grants to cover both elements of the building and the and perhaps the wet, wet sales and, and therefore some may have lost some opportunities. So I don't know if there are areas where we can look at things a bit more imaginatively or if there's any backdating that could be done. But it is really essential that we as a council look carefully at how we keep these centres going in the interim otherwise they're not going to be be there and available to do the job that they did um, and, and and they a lot of them are, are on their uppers make no bones about it um, generally also I, I I am a bit concerned about the level of funding I mean 130,000 uh, give or take a, a few hundred pounds isn't a lot of money in in reality when you when there's a lot to do and going forward I'm concerned about increasing levels of poverty and hardship and demand on food banks and 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 would really like to understand how we as a council can do more to support f food banks as well as community centres and also if if it I don't know if you have this available, if it's a, it's a matter for a separate conversation, it's about how we supported um, BAME and disabled communities, um, particularly those for whom their language is not first language isn't, isn't English and I include in that people who are reliant on British Sign Language not not just um, other languages like Nepali or Hindu or, or so on. Um, it has taken, and I'm very grateful that somebody has actually made some changes now to the, the, the website, because the links that were on the council's website that actually pointed people to uh, government uh, information in different languages and in sign language had not in fact worked at all. They were dead links for five months, uh, and it's taken a long time for that to, to change. And, and I did ask the, the leader to, to look at that for me a couple of days ago, so I'm glad that's happened. But I think on reflecting on that, the link that says click here if you, you need this information in a different language is actually in English. I mean, I'm not sure that works really. Um, and, and it's easy for us to think, well, maybe we don't have a, a large non-speaking English community, but in fact, we do. Um, and we have sort of, you know, areas in, in, in Basingstoke where the level of English speaking is quite low. And given the fact that we know that the BAME community is at great risk uh, uh, if they catch uh, COVID, then I would really like to understand, I think, in more detail what we've done to support those those communities, because it's it, having spoken to some of the community leaders, it, my impression is is that perhaps they don't remember what it was. So I'd like to see us do more to communicate properly and thoughtfully uh, to, to non-English speaking communities, including um, British Sign Language, and, and you're ready to understand what we have done. Um, as well as looking at, you know, how do we support food banks in what's going to be a really bad time and the community centres. Daniel, can I hand that over to you? Sure. So on the um, on the food bank sort of side of things, um, we as part kind of the DEFRA funding you mentioned, Councillor Tillet, and I appreciate that it's not a huge amount, but we have ring fenced some some part of that funding for the food bank specifically to be able to respond. I think you know to to hardship because I mean this is, from my perspective, I think you know if we have a second wave in Basingstoke, it's probably kind of our main concern. I don't think we're going to have kind of the same level of, of of demand for emergency food, but more kind of for for longer term kind of financial difficulties and that's why you know as i mentioned earlier i think we're kind of working very closely with cab uh, citizens advice and and the food bank and i think and you know, we kind of really monitor closely 
how the food bank is coping so that we're able kind of to step in if we need to provide support. Um, on the BME communities, um, I think in the, in the report I mentioned, I think, you know, that there was a lot of work taking place behind the scenes, I would say, with our um, um, inclusion and, and diversity officer, liaising directly with the various groups we have locally, providing information, making sure they kind of add access where to find it. I take your point about some of the challenges on the website and take your point about, you know, if you don't speak English and having a link in English is not particularly helpful. Um, we do have a, a translation service for the contact center. So, you know, if people call for example they don't speak english we can actually bring interpreters to actually translate for for us so if you know we can we're still able to support um, residents through that on the uh, residents with disabilities sort of front i think you know through the the requests we were getting we were kind of asking very specific questions about kind of the specific needs of of, of residents so we were actually able kind of to deal with that those issues and and signpost people or refer people to the right the right organization and as i said i think in my introduction i think you know at the start you know we were learning a lot of you know as we went along to be honest but you know with time that improved greatly and we're kind of we're able kind of to ask the uh, the relevant questions and the required questions to be able to triage and, and assess the needs the needs properly councillor taylor do you have a supplementary to that uh, not really, uh, other than perhaps, you know, you might be able to, to tell us if there are any opportunities uh, about us trying to support the, the um, community centres um, a, a little a little more. Um, I think on community centres, I mean, one thing that I haven't mentioned is um, as part of the discretionary kind of grant scheme that we offered to businesses, uh, quite a few community centers were eligible for that funding and actually got an additional grant you know like like a normal business as well as a kind of link to the, the the business rates um i think you know as i said i think you know we kind of have daily conversations with community centers to assess the situation assess the needs what the challenges are we con constantly look for kind of you know funding opportunities where we can sign post people and, as, and support them with applications as well and i think you know there's something else the council needs probably to consider but i think i'll probably hand this one over to um, to you in terms of council funding because <laughs> I can't make any commitments on this front. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'm actually any more empowered to um, specifically offer up any funding, but certainly happy to take away the question as to what that might be, if we, it, what we can explore. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hickling. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, first off, just to reiterate everybody else, um, to the officers, fantastic report. It's very good reading uh, going through it, especially covering the lessons learned. It's great to see all of the, uh, the operational improvements we've got there for any future pandemic response, which is fantastic. But um, a quick question, because I know this, is, this particular topic is specifically on the community response uh, to local emergencies, specifically uh, flus. Um, does the uh, do the lessons learned from this are they going to be feeding back into the council's pandemic response plan itself? Do these form part of our pandemic response plan? And I just want to make sure that we don't lose these uh, uh, fantastic insights we've got moving forward over the next three, five, ten years time. Should this ever occur again? Uh, can I? Uh... Daniel, can I hand that over to you? I Ian, can I hand it over to you? Yeah, um, uh, yes, they will. Yeah, all these lessons that will feed into uh, updated um, <clears throat> business continuity plans and our pandemic response. Excellent. Are there any more questions? Uh, Councillor Vaughan. Thank you. Yes, a, a different subject. I was just waiting to see if anybody else brought it up. In, in paragraph 615, uh, which is page 24 of the pack, it talks about um, availability of staff um, uh, as the council got back in, into normal working at the same time as, as, as we were trying to, to run a COVID response. Um, and I, I found it a very worrying um, paragraph, you know, talking about some individuals working every weekend and struggling to manage demands alongside their usual work. Um, and um, I just wondered what we will do differently in future to avoid that happening. I realise it's really, really hard 
to be able to predict this kind of um, level of, of work. But um, I, I, I think that is, I didn't pick up what we would do that would um, try and avoid that uh, occurrence again. No, thank you, Councillor Lovox. I mean, the, um, we're in a different place at the moment in the fact that we've got a lot more volunteers working with BVA to be able kind of to, to step up and, and pick up some of the inquiries. We are sort of, you know, we have done a, um, a check, you know, kind of see how many staff we have internally that will be able kind of to step up again and, and pick up some of the functions of the uh, the community hub. And also, I think, you know, again, a lesson learned along the way is that we've also reduced the the number of shifts and the length of the shift that people are doing. So, I think, you know, sometimes we found that people would do like, you know, four hour or five hour shift. And I think we reduce that to two hour slots because I think, you know, we know it's, it's quite, it's quite, they can be quite challenging conversations. So we have put kind of sort of processes and measures in place. But I think, you know, in terms of capacity, we have got a pool of council staff, but we've also got a much bigger pool of volunteers through BVA that are also able to pick up and answer the, um, the, the, the inquiries as they come in. Okay, thank you. I don't have any more people asking for questions, so um, I'll just sum up. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody, and um, I thank everybody who's been involved in it, particularly the volunteers, the BVA, all the council staff. Um, it's been a true wartime spirit in getting everything together, and I think as a community we've responded quite well. And um, it's good to know we're geared up for the second wave, which is probably imminent. Um, we and, and we're geared up to step step things up early as well. Uh, we need to look into community set centre support and funding. Uh, food banks do have funding, but obviously we need to keep on top of that. And uh, we do need to look into BAME support. I don't think there's anything else there. Okay, I shall move on to item seven, which is the Community Environment Partnerships Work Programme. So we've got... Uh, the next meeting is on the 16th of December. Uh, we've got an update on the ice rink, and hopefully that should be a comprehensive update, including um, com uh, comments on the on the reports which we, we, we received on Friday. Uh, we've also got uh, quite a comprehensive modernising uh, hospitals and healthcare services. Uh, so we've got quite a busy night that night. On the 20th of January, we've got another update on the ice rink and nothing else planned. And then again, on the 17th, we've got another update on the ice rink with nothing else planned. So to be timetabled, we've got the Be Love Review and Update, Care Leavers and Corporate Parenting Update. And um, if anybody's got anything else, can I, can I ask you to fill out a work program suggestion form to enable the item to be timetabled? For the CC, we've also got um, so the current and planned work group, working groups. We've got CCG task and finish group. Uh, this is a review to gather evidence of the impact of GP mergers and reshaping of the GP services to better appreciate our residents' concerns and issues. So officers have contacted the CCG but have not yet received a response. So um, can I ask? Uh, Council, council work um, officers to, to chase that up. We've also got recycling from flats, apartments, task and finish group. So this is to review steps are taken to improve the recycling rate from its current levels uh, and to investigate any barriers to maximizing recycling potential from flats and apartment blocks. So um, at, the, at the committee held on the 16th of the 9th, the task and finish group was was raised with the cabinet member where she stated that work with officers had continued and that she would raise the issue with them to find out whether it was possible to restart the work of the task and finish group. So um, again, can we, can we chase that? 
And then we've got one for the libraries, and this is to identify the use of the libraries and other community facilities for activities they are not currently used for, such as remote working, health and education outreach, and identifying suitable partners to help bring this about. Also, uh, to support the local community groups to consider whether business case cases could be put forward to acquire the venues. So um, this, the update is the Assistant Democratic Service Officer has written to the relevant officers to find out when the group can have their first meeting. And at the moment, we've got uh, Councillor uh, Kim Taylor, Councillor Colin Regan and Councillor Jenny Vaux. Um, Councillor Mahaffey, did you show interest for that as well? Yes, I was going to say, I thought my name was on that. If I could be added to that, I'd be grateful. Yeah, that might be my fault. I probably didn't communicate it, but uh, we can put you on that, that as well. So I think uh, I think that's just about it. So, Chairman, you've got uh, Councillor Taylor is waving at you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Taylor. Uh, oh. Councillor Taylor, I think you're on mute. Right, thank you. I probably muted myself as well. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to add something or ask if we could possibly add something to the agenda next week, uh, next for the next meeting, the, the work program for the next meeting. And, and I'm quite happy to send in a, a form with all the, the full details. It's really sort of an, something that I think is reasonably short and contained. Um, I wanted to know if we could have a briefing in respect of um, a specific element of our waste service in, in relation to the replacement of... Um, uh, wheelie bins and glass uh, recycling bins uh, in, in relation to the service, the demand for the service, the trends, number of replacements boxes re required, reasons uh, for replacement, disputed damage and, and so on. Because um, the reason that I, I'm, I'm, I'd quite like us to have a briefing on, on that, to have a look at that issue, uh, is really because uh, I don't know if other colleagues have been, but certainly we've been getting... Um, sort of in increased comments from residents about um, bins getting broken uh, and, and issues around payment and, and those sorts of things. And so I just really wanted to get some sort of briefing on the nature of, of the service and, and, and the size of it, uh, really, to get, a, get an indication of, of, of is there a problem or isn't there really? Okay, uh, I am conscious that um, next meeting will be quite comprehensive anyway. Um, I, I, we can certainly talk, talk to the portfolio holder. Um, would a like a statement, like I did for the other thing, would that suffice? Because I can I can do that, and that's not a problem. Um, I'll get a statement on that. I mean, uh, some sort of briefing report might might be ad adequate at this point. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has has, has been experiencing the same same thing at all. Yeah, I, I'd add to that. I'm getting a load of complaints about broken bins, especially the grey ones, which don't get replaced. People seem to be saying that the bins are fine. They're, you know, they go to the cart and they come back broken, or they come in from work, they're broken and expected to pay, I don't know whether it is, £60, is it, or something for a new bin. And uh, if there is a problem out there, we need to know about it because not everybody's got 60 pounds. And if there isn't a problem, all well and good. Okay, well, that's certainly something we can use this committee to, to raise as, as a subject. Uh, and and I'll, I'll speak to the portfolio holder about a statement for the next meeting and then maybe um, a more comprehensive review, probably in the new year when we, we've, we've got um, time on the agenda, really. Um, oh. So I can put that forward. Sorry, Councillor Jones. Yeah, it's just uh, not on this issue. It's this CCG task and finish group. I know it's an awkward time, but uh, I'm getting a lot of complaints and a lot of up from older people in particular about their doctors. It doesn't seem to be working. We have, I know it <laughs> can't complain too much because of what's been going on, but we need to try and push this forward a bit more because the way we're going now is everything online. And not everybody's online and they're finding contacting the doctor is pretty hard and long winded. Now, what we can do about it or not, I don't know, but it's not working for, the, for our residents or not mine in particular. But I know it's not just my one, but I think it's across the board because they all go to different 
how these surgeries are combined, it doesn't seem to be working. And that's what we were looking at. I don't know whether we can progress this or what's, what we're expecting later on in the year, but uh, I think we need to try and push it a bit. Yeah. It's definitely not working. Uh, yeah, no worries. Really I'll, I'll raise that with officers and, and see if we can get anything from them. If we could, yeah, that'd be great. Excellent. Any more questions before we close out? No, excellent. I think this is probably the quickest uh, meeting we've had in CEP, to be honest. I think I'm, I'm quite quite impressed. Like, you can never predict it, but uh, it's eight, it's just coming up to eight o'clock now. And uh, sorry, I'm getting somebody waving or have a cleaning. Councillor Regan, are you cleaning your camera or are you waving at me? Am I still muted? Uh, yeah, no, can hear you. Oh, good. It's just like a raise for the 20th of January, uh, the uh, an update on the football ground. The development yeah. of the football ground. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, we're in this period where we've got to wait to see what happens with the DC and, and this appeal. So um, I'm not sure if we'll have anything to report, but I'll try and keep my finger on the pulse there. And uh, if anything happens, then I'll, I'll report it back every meeting, to be honest. That's my right. intention. I just like to support what the, uh, Councillor Jones said about the doctors' surgeries. I mean, it's it's a common problem, uh, a technology anyway. Actually, they're an old generation, especially my constituents, who, uh, who have who have trouble. And one of the ones is uh, swiping in at the moment OPR mobile phone to say the test and track uh, system. That's doesn't always work. My phone don't work. And other people were having trouble as well. And not everybody is offering pen and paper either. Well, we'll see see what uh, what what. Well, we'll we'll raise that as an issue and see see what can uh, come up, yeah. come of that. Too much reliance on technology. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I could just quickly comment on that. Yeah, no worries. So I think the CCG task and finish group probably are, won't now address this now new uh, issue that we have because. It, it, it was the pre-COVID world that we had the CCG. Yes, it was talking about GP practices merging and things, but actually these are, are new issues. Um, I don't know if people saw the data, but the number of deaths in people's homes um, in the south uh, of England were excessive over the last six months. I mean, massively over. People are not accessing their GP services. They're not going to A&E. And a lot of people are dying at home who would normally have accessed other services. Um, so there is something going on about not accessing GP services. I'm not quite sure what we can do at a borough level about that, but um, it might be that we convene, we, we reset the terms of reference of that CCG task group or relook at what the terms of reference were and see whether we can have another meeting of it. But I don't think what we've asked the CCG at the moment at the CCGs will answer the questions that Councillor Jones and Councillor Regan have brought up. Okay, thanks for that. We'll see if, see if we can get anything from the officers and uh, try, try and get some sort of response to that for the next meeting. Okay, so um, it's uh, it's now four minutes past eight, uh, and I declare the meeting closed.